Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, friends and neighbors. Today we have a special treat. We're going to hear about the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. It's recognized as a treasure in our own backyard. And we're going to hear the, about what is going on there, what changes have taken place there, and what the plans of the future are. And we're very privileged to have Bobby Hedges, a docent of the aquarium with 14 years of experience. So welcome, Bobby Hedges. Thank you, Gene. And thank you all for inviting me here today. It's been a pleasure for me to come up here and see your beautiful location up here overlooking the ocean. Down at uh, Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, I have been a volunteer for, well, this is going on my 14th year, and uh, we go through courses as volunteers for different things. I'm a docent. I take around school children, adults, and groups like yourselves around the aquarium for private tours. Uh, we do that all weekdays. Then uh, we have lots of special events like whale of a day and uh, different beach cleanups and uh, whale fiesta and earth day and just you name it, anything environmental, we have it there and it's always a lot of fun. We have a Halloween scare night, sea scare night, where all the kids come and get free trick or treats and it's all made up in dark hallways and hanging uh, fun things. And uh, we also have a whale watch program that I'm part of and have done the same thing for 14 years. Um, the ACS, American Cetacean Society, sponsors along with the aquarium uh, the whale watching. The boats go out, we go out on the boats. I usually have a partner. We explain everything we see from birds to sharks to jellyfish to uh, all the different whales, uh, dolphins, and porpoises that we see out there, and the birds as well, so that if we have birders or if we have people who really like the whales or really like the dolphins, we'll get a little bit of everything. So today we're going to kind of do an overview, and um, I'll be explaining further with the slides, but the aquarium has been around for many years, and it started um, with a lifeguard. John Olgeen was a lifeguard and many of you probably know John Olgeen and some of his history. Uh, he was Man of the Year uh, in San Pedro and lots of different things. He is now our Director Emeritus for the Aquarium and he's still involved. He's still involved every meeting that we have, the training meetings, uh, he goes out on the big whale watches to help narrate and make all of his great whale sounds and dolphin sounds and things like that. And he's just amazing with his wife Muriel. So it started out where he came out on the beach as a lifeguard and set up a little table with a lot of um, specimens in jars so that he could show the kids what was going on and if a whale happened to come by and he happened to see a blow out there he'd say okay let's wait two minutes there's gonna be a whale everybody ready and you look out there and there's a big whale blow and all the kids go how did he do that <laughs> but anyway he's amazing and so that's how our aquarium started it was over at the old bathhouse and then um, I believe it was in the early 80s, we moved to the new aquarium and he was very responsible for um, helping get the funds, he and Bill Samaras, a uh, geologist, to get the funds to start putting up this great big gray whale skeleton and we had to have a building to put it in, so came our aquarium. So I'm very pleased to work there. I spend many hours there, and I also do uh, most of the special occasions there. We're going to talk about Southern California marine life. Some of the things we're going to talk about are the kelp forest, which is out in the ocean, the rocky shore, which is along where our tide pools are, uh, the wave-swept sandy beach where the grunion come, right here, and then the protected inner beach, which is here where we don't really have waves, and the salt marsh, which is out here next to the uh, parking lot and by the launch ramp. And then we have the native plant garden, which is actually down in here right behind the aquarium on the way out to the salt marsh. And here's a picture of our aquarium down here. This was designed by uh, Wright Jr., uh, who's a famous uh, archaeologist, uh, who's a famous um, uh, architect and um, gives a, a nice um, view of the the wave configuration in the front. 
we have now mostly live organisms in tanks and of course our we don't have the huge tanks uh, to keep uh, dolphins porpoises and uh, sea lions and things like that but most of our organisms are alive and we are so lucky here um, to be here we are the only aquarium left that is free of charge and that has all of these features the the big kelp forest around it many aquariums aren't even on the ocean we are all right on the ocean supplied by a lot of its ocean water we have the sandy beaches we have a nice ramp that even wheelchairs can go out to the um, the tide pools and have access and look at uh, the low tides out there uh, we have the grunion program on our sandy beach out here uh, then we also have the salt marsh here and many aquariums don't have any access to a salt marsh or a mud flat where there are many burrowing animals in the mud and then the native plant garden that is tended by the volunteers and a lot of students that come out who are interested in uh, helping us maintain our uh, native plant garden. This is one of our sandy beaches and this is where the grunion come in and it, you can see it's a nice sloping beach up here with many of the seabirds here. We have different types of gulls. There are at least three types of gulls out here. And we'll get the uh, little sandpipers that run up and down with the waves and the willets and many of the seabirds that are out here. But on grunion nights, when the grunion come, we have the black crowned night herons that come in and scoop up the first ones. They're all standing along the beach waiting for uh, the, gr the first grunion to come ashore. And if you uh, have not seen the grunion before, it's really something you need to see before uh, your bucket list is gone. And um, <laughs> so, um, and then also the great blue herons are in evidence as well at night. And then um, uh, we'll get gulls as well. So in the very, very dark with just the moon shining on the water, you'll see all these night birds coming out to pick up the first grunion. It's really exciting. We have a crew that goes out and gives a talk beforehand in the auditorium and then uh, we all troop out to the beach with our flashlights and it's just amazing to have 2,000 kids out there with flashlights and when they say turn off your lights they all go off. Not unimaginable. <laughs> now this is a willet. Uh, you've probably seen these guys digging for little sand crabs along the beach right in the sand. They have a long bill so they can probe down into the sand and grab those little sand crabs. They love those. They pretty much wade in the water where the little sandpipers run from the waves back and forth. Okay, and here we have a picture of a lot of the uh, clams that are burrowed underneath the sand, some of our burrowing animals, little um, crabs like the fiddler crab and um, the bird tracks all around the holes there that you can see where the birds have been digging down in those holes. And here are some of the animals that burrow. This is a, on the right, is uh, called a uh, gooey duck and they are a, an Asian uh, delicacy. And they are very, very strong uh, clam that has a big foot at the bottom big heavy foot and if you go to dig for it it goes just pounds right down in the sand and you can't find it it just disappears so that's gooey duck on the uh, left hand side we have a couple of ghost shrimp and they dig a burrow all the way to the top so you don't know really what's underneath all those little holes down there uh, it might be a fiddler crab they come up in the in the morning and in the evening to feed in the air so they can be either in the water or up in the air this is an olive snail, olive shell, and they're, they're very small, but um, the snails, as you can see, the proboscis on this one, on the slide here, just a little head here, and they burrow their way through the sand looking for little bits of stuff that's in the sand. So that's one of the animals that would be in the mud flat, sandy, sandy area. And um, it's also a home for little tiny new um, hermit crabs that carry it around uh, wrapped with their tail inside as a protective home. Here's our sand dollar and you can see the sand dollar actually burying itself. In the sand dollar beds they all sit on their edges so that with the water washing over both sides all the 
the plankton, all the little dead bits and stuff in the water can attach themselves, get attached to the, the spiny areas on either side of the sand dollar, and then we'll get a close-up on the next slide where uh, it'll show the food moving along the food grooves to the mouth on the bottom so that if they're on their side, it's very much more economical for them. They can collect food on both sides of their shell rather than just on the top and the mouth is on the bottom, so they don't want to be upside down. Our sand dollars would not want to be on their bottom being exposed with food just on the top because the mouth is right in the center of the bottom. This is a relative of the sea star, of the sea urchin. It's like a very flat sea urchin. And so the, the mouth is always in the center of the bottom underneath. And here's our picture of the bottom side of the sand dollar. And this is a kind of close-up, so you can really see the spines. This is an echinoderm, uh, and echinoderm means spiny skin. So all of those animals that I talked about, the sea star, the sea urchin, the sand dollar, the sea cucumber, all have a spiny skin. The mouth, right in the center, has a little tiny beak, and uh, that's where the food gets channeled. You can see these food channels here. Um, all get channeled toward the mouth in the center. So if they're sitting up on their edge, it's a much more economical way to feed. And when we go out there and dive in the ocean, you're gonna see huge sand dollar beds with just hundreds of sand dollars all up on their edges feeding. It's really a cool area. It's a protected area also, one of our marine protected areas off the beach. Now here's our grunion, and it's nighttime. As you can tell, it's probably close to midnight, 11.30 and grunion are coming in mass and what they do is this is the only fish that comes out of the water to lay its eggs in the sand and what it needs is the newest moon or the full moon the highest tides all together and that makes the fish able to swim way up on the beach and then wiggle themselves up out of the water the highest tide, and the females then are digging their tails down into the sand and just their heads sticking out. The males are swimming all around, maybe six males around every female, um, releasing their milk that will uh, fertilize those eggs. Those eggs will stay underneath the sand, and here you can see the female with just her head sticking out and all the males swimming around trying to find the females. And you notice they're all out of the water. They're flip-flopping with their tails and their fins and their very limber bodies. They're only about six or seven inches long. And um, they're very, very limber, so they can flip and flop and move that way. And they slither in the wet sand. Here are the eggs that are developing. And you can see the two little eyes, very large eyes for the size of the body. You can see the egg sac inside, the yolk sac that they feed on until they're hatched. They sit down there in that sand. They don't get wet because remember it was the highest tide that they came up on. So we don't get another high tide for about 10 more days. And when the next high tide comes up, those eggs begin to get wet. And as they get wet, they start popping and hatching all those little grunion. Then it takes another good wave to come up and all those little grunion swim back out to the sea. So it's, um, it's a great process to watch, and it's one of the things that we have the children do when they come for tours in our spring program. They all get a little baby food jar with the sand and the eggs in it, and we pour the seawater in, and they get to swirl it all around, and they watch those fish pop right up out of the eggs. It's really exciting to see them see that for the first time. And the grown-ups as well. Many grown-ups have never seen a fish hatch from an egg, and uh, it's really exciting. Here's a baby just born, empty egg shell. You can see the shell has kind of broken in half and is now empty, the egg yolk all gone, and that fish is ready to go out and try to survive in the ocean. Uh, we think about maybe one out of every 100,000 are gonna survive that make it back to the ocean. Um, not all eggs are fertile, but of the ones that do hatch, uh, it's, um, most of them are eaten with the plankton. They swim with the plankton, are eaten by other animals, and so um, the survival rate is, is very low. However, each female produces about 300,000 eggs when they come ashore, so that with all these different females coming ashore, laying all these 300,000 eggs, 
um, it, there's a pretty good chance that we're going to have more grunion. We have a nice picture of the mud flats, the salt area. This is right to the north side of the aquarium. There's a ramp that runs out there. It's at low tide on this picture here. On higher tide, it has water covering all of that muddy area. And this is where we see the great blue herons, the kingfishers diving for fish. Um, we see the, um, the night herons come in, the green herons. And um, many times like um, yellow crowned herons, we have, um, you'll see different crabs, you'll see different fish, you'll see all kinds of the animals that are active early in the morning, in the evening, and when the tide ebbs and flows. Now, the mudflats is what is our nursery, our ocean's nursery, and it's one of the most important parts of our ocean. It's not the prettiest place. It's always muddy. People throw trash. You would never want to swim there. But the moms, the pregnant moms, have their babies there until they get large enough to go out into the ocean. What would happen if all the fish laid their eggs out in the ocean? They'd all get eaten as food and we wouldn't have any baby fish. So these fish are able to survive in the mud flats until they get large enough to, to uh, take care of themselves in the open ocean. Here's a nice overview of our mud flats, our salt flat area. And on that little island out in the middle there, this is where a lot of the birds roost. And that's where with binoculars we can stand or sit. There's a little amphitheater here and then the ramp I was talking about and watch what goes on out there. You have to sit and be quiet. You're going to see everything from hummingbirds to kingfishers to all different kinds of birds out there, gulls and so forth. Now here's the launch ramp right next to there where the boats come and go. So this is kind of a quiet backwater here. This area has very high levels of detritus, which is dead stuff, and uh, the flotsam and jetsam that comes in with the tide. It's a very nutrient-rich mud. So many animals will be burrowing there, where we talked about the uh, fiddler crabs and the ghost shrimp and uh, all the different uh, mud shrimp and um, lots of animals that uh, can survive in the mud. It's not a real oxygen-rich mud, um, but it's high nutrient. Many plants surround the mudflat areas. If you're familiar with some of the plants there, the pickleweed, this is what it looks like in a big bunch. Pickleweed and salt grass, very tough grasses that can survive in a salty area and uh, they don't get a lot of rain. Some of the things that burrow we talked about, the clams, little neck clams, the uh, innkeeper worm, that's a long bodied worm that digs a big burrow, lives under the water. The mud shrimp. Some of the animals that live in the water there, the fish, would be the walleye surf perch up in the left. Leopard shark, which we have also live in the aquarium, but out at the salt flats, you'll see the leopard shark. The staghorn sculpin, and then the California halibut. They like to be on the bottom. They are definitely a bottom fish. They bury themselves in the sand. Uh, by fluttering. They have fins all the way around their body so that when they flutter their body they just go down in the sand and get covered. Then when some tiny fish come along they hop up and grab them and what's interesting about the halibut is that when they're born they have an eye on each side like a regular fish. They swim like a regular fish but about a month into their uh, development they turn on their side. So the eye that was on the left side moves across the body up to the top so that they then have the two eyes up on top. Actually moves across the top of the head. Then the mouth is at the right so um, or the left. I mean, depending on which side they're on, we call them a left-hander or a right-hander, depending on where the mouth is and which side they're lying on. And then they hide in the sand underneath and then jump up and grab their prey bury themselves again, and then digest. So all you can really see when you're down diving or when you're looking under the sand there under the water is that big eye of the halibut that is exposed up in the sand so that he can see. Uh, then some of the birds that live in the mudflat areas, we talked about the willet up on the left, a uh, very endangered bird, the clapper rail on the right, and then the great blue heron, and they can get quite tall. They have very long necks and very long legs. 
and then the little sandpiper that runs back and forth uh, with the waves and doesn't really wade. They've got very, very short little legs that run real fast back and forth. Now an interesting thing about our human development of the area. This is a picture of our harbor as it was circa 1917. You can see that there were originally 3,450 acres of wetlands. Wetlands are where the rivers come and join the ocean. And it's swampy areas, and it's backwaters, and it's sloughs. Um, and if you've ever been in those areas, there's lots of wildlife. What else it does is it leaches out all the heavy metals, all the toxins, everything into the earth before it gets to the ocean. So we were able to keep our oceans much cleaner when we had a lot of wetlands. What happened here is there's no harbor here to speak of. You can see the sandy beach along there. There was a lumber company back up here, if any are longtime residents. You would know the history back there of all the lumber company there. There was a river that ran through here and all through here. And there was Devil's Island out there. So what they did to develop this area was to dynamite Devil's Island, got rid of it. Um, dynamited a lot of the areas, got rid of uh, the river that came through there, and channeled everything into the big harbor as we know it. Now, only about three and a half acres out of that 3,400 acres of wetland here survive today, which is a problem. Things that we used to get in the river and get leached out into the ground are now going straight to the ocean. And that includes insecticides and hormones and you name it. So now the harbor has all of the gantries. Of course, it's the second largest running harbor in the world, uh, Long Beach and LA Harbor. But we also have Pier 400 where the turns uh, are protected and nobody can build there. Now there are many other types of birds that are also nesting there. This is a snowy egret uh, having his lunch. They're a beautiful bird with the yellow feet. We also have the great white egrets and the blue herons and the white herons as well. Now we go on to the rocky shore and if you're familiar with some of the animals that live in the rocky shore, we have the giant green anemones. Uh, this is a test or a shell left over from a sea urchin, the small purple sea urchin. And if you come down along the tide pools, when the tide goes out, uh, generally of course twice a day, but it'll usually go out in the, sometime in the afternoon when it's really nice for tide pooling. And if you can wear good shoes and you're kind of steady footed, um, you can walk out there and see uh, sea slugs and sea stars and urchins and um, hermit crabs and all kinds of animals that reside there. Small octopus, um, all different kinds of animals that like the rocky shore. Now here's our purple sea urchin. We have a red sea urchin, which is usually much larger. Uh, this small purple sea urchin, and it's one of the spiny skinned echinoderms, a relative to the sea star and the sand dollar. As you can see, all the knobs where the spines were attached, and then it also has the little tube feet that can hang on tightly to the rock so that it can live in the rocky shore where the waves then crash in. So if it can't get a nice little burrow and hang on tightly, it would get all broken up on the rocks. These are very fragile animals. And uh, one thing they like to do is eat the kelp. And so we have kind of a cyclical program that, uh, not, that we don't run, that they run, nature runs, where they eat all the kelp. We went for years without much kelp around Palos Verdes, and now it's coming back again because all the sea urchins kind of um, died off because they ate all their food. So that's one thing that they really decimate uh, the stalks right down to the holdfast on the kelp. And here you can see the purple sea urchins in their little niches. Each one has burrowed out a little niche for itself right in the rocks and with those two feet and they have a little beak underneath and they can actually uh, chomp away to make a little burrow for themselves, a little hole. This is another resident of the rocky shore and then we'd find these in the tide pools. These are uh, keyhole limpets. It's a mollusk, a one-shelled animal. And I have one here with me today. This is an empty one. It looks like a big eyeball or a volcano, if you will. This one that you're seeing on the slide has a mantle surrounding it 
that is very yucky tasting to the fish so that they can protect themselves. They won't get eaten. It's like an abalone. Anything would like to catch this keyhole limpet and eat it. And so for protection, it has this mantle that covers the shell. The hole in the center is the anus where it gets rid of its waste. And so if you're down at the tide pools, you don't want to put your finger in the middle. Now this is the tongue of all the snails, all the mollusks and snails um, that are in the uh, rocky shore area. And what we see here is a magnified view of the proboscis, which is the mouth parts coming out, the radula, which is the tongue, and the teeth on the tongue, the cusp on the tongue. And it makes a rasping sound as it comes out and rakes the rocks, can actually dig a pathway through the rock and remove some of the rock. And what it's doing is eating all the algae and critters that are growing on that rock. Here's a magnified view of the teeth on the radula, on the tongue of the snails. And you can see it's kind of like a chainsaw. If it moved back and forth, it would be very sharp and rough and could actually gouge out um, trails in the rocks. They gouge out a little place for themselves so that when the tide goes out and they're going to get dry, they can hunker down, glue themselves in that little hole and be perfectly safe until the tide comes back in. And you can see some periwinkles here that have done just that. They are having their trails here all around. And this is all where the, the snails have gouged out areas in the rock. Again, a fancy one here. This is very economical because it's covering tremendous amounts of food area in a very short space of time. And going back and forth and eating all the algae that's on that rock. This is a giant green anemone, sea anemone, and um, you can see the tentacles and the mouth in the middle. And of course, they can glue themselves to a rock and stay stationary, or they can release themselves from the rock and cartwheel away. Say, for instance, a sunflower star, which is a voracious sea star, comes along, they can actually uh, cartwheel away from that uh, sunflower star. There are many programs on TV, if you've watched um, National Geographic or some of the Novas, that show this in uh, speeded up film. It's really cool to watch them move because you think they're sedentary. When we touch them in the touch tank, we touch just the tentacles. The mouth is very fragile. This leads to the stomach and could harm it if we put, uh, touch the center. So we have the children just touch the tentacles and it feels like wet spaghetti with scotch tape stuck on it. It's, they're kind of sticky when you go to let go. So it's kind of a fun thing to touch. Here's another green anemone and many animals that live uh, around in the rocky shore area. A little rock crab. This little rock crab likes to hide in the crevices and then when it sees anything that it can eat, jump out and grab it with its nice husky claws. And there's a little periwinkle snail right up behind it. Here's our sea star. The sea star is one of the most fabulous animals because it looks just very common every day, doing nothing, sitting there. But when you get a close look at the anatomy of the sea star, it's amazing. We used to call this a starfish, but it's not really a fish. So now the scientists like to use the word sea star. You can see the tube feet here as it moves along. It also uses the tube feet to grab a uh, mussel or snail and pull it open, may take four or five hours of pulling, but it is strong enough to hold on and pull and pull and pull until that bivalve will give up and open up, and then it throws up its stomach, whoop, inside the shell, dissolves the whole meat of the shell, and then swallows its stomach again. So when the stomach comes out, of course, it's inside out and has all those nice enzymes there to dissolve the meat and then swallows the stomach back down again. So that's a fascinating part. Another thing is that sea stars are always clean. They never have anything growing on them. Have you noticed that? They don't have shells, they don't have algae, they don't have anything growing on their skins. And that's because they have a very interesting feature. If you look on the skin here, the spiny skin, if you feel it, it feels kind of like um, sandpaper. This is, uh, happens to be a bat star. The skin is kind of rough and you can see all these little sections here. Each one of those is a little spine. 
it's kind of a soft spine, but it's a spine nonetheless. And it's in its own little separate area. And all around these spines are little tiny pinchers called pedicellaria. And they're so microscopic, we can actually see them in a microscope. If you look carefully here, what I was talking about are all these little spines here. And around each little spine, you can see all those little jaws like Pac-Man, little tiny pinchers. And here's an open one right here. Here's another open one. Here's another open one. And these pedicellaria are constantly picking things off the skin of the sea star everywhere it goes so that nothing can land and grow on a sea star. It's amazing what happens when you get under the microscope and see the anatomy of this guy. And of course, the mouth is in the center on the bottom, just like all the other echinoderms. And here are the tube feet. You can see that each little foot has a sucker on it so that when the waves come crashing in, what it generally will do will find a shelf of rock and glue itself underneath the shelf so that when the waves come crashing in, it will be protected underneath that rock. So if you're out on the tide pools, you want to kind of take a look under the shelves of rock to find the sea stars. And here's our moray eel. Uh, we have a moray eel in one of our tanks, our touch tank. Not that we touch, but it's behind the area that kids touch. And it's about four feet long. They're yellow and green. Uh, they breathe through their mouth, so the mouth is always open. They always look dangerous, like they're threatening you, but that's the way they breathe. So it's not that they're threatening, they just breathe through their mouth and out through their gills. And a wolf eel. We have many wolf eels. What they do is they find a crevice in the rocks and they go in backwards and they get their tail way down in the rock with just their big ugly mug sticking out. And uh, it really is an ugly mug. <laughs> then we have the sharks. This one happens to be a horn shark. The reason it's called a horn shark is you get the little horns on the two dorsal fins here. And if you happen to step on one, that wouldn't feel so good. But these are small. They really only get maybe three, four feet, something like that. And they eat things that are in the sand like clams and all the animals that are buried in the sand and the mud. Now we have a horn shark egg. The horn shark egg is like a corkscrew, but it looks sort of like a drill. And the horn shark lives inside of it with an egg yolk and consumes all of that yolk until it gets too large. It takes almost a year for them to mature enough to work their way out of that, out of that egg. It's like a leather case. Here's our state marine fish, the Garibaldi. The Garibaldi is bright orange, can't be missed if you see it in the ocean, and they're very territorial. So if you walk down along the beach, look on the rocky shore where, the, where the, the, there's a pier or something, or there's a harbor, you're going to see those Garibaldi in their own area, and they're very territorial. Um, it was named after, uh, funny enough, an Italian general named Garibaldi who liked to wear orange. Go figure. Now, this is one of our divers. Actually, this is our director of the aquarium, Mike Schott. And he goes out swimming every day to um, not only get exercise, but he also collects Garibaldi eggs. He has a license from the aquarium to collect them and raise them in our aquarium. And we send them all around the country and the world. Um, he, there, he's behind the mask here. And the Garibaldi are so territorial that they will try to chase an adult diver away from their nest. They're very, very pesky, and they will keep bombing you with their little, their little mouths until you back off. And they do not like to have him come and collect their eggs. But it's a really interesting learning experience at the aquarium to watch them hatch from the eggs and then to husband them so that we can have them survive to adulthood. It's a, not an easy thing to do to recreate the niche from the ocean in the laboratory. But that's one of our new buildings that you really have to come and see um, where all the research goes on. Here are the eggs that it leaves behind. Hundreds of thousands of eggs with all the little egg yolks in each little egg. So we collect only a very few to bring to the aquarium to, uh, to raise and do research on. Now this is a juvenile. They're, they have these electric blue spots all over them. 
uh, as a juvenile. And the younger they are, the more electric blue spots they have all over them. And the older they are, they lose those blue spots and become just gold as well as larger. So this is a juvenile Garibaldi. Nice picture of our kelp forest. The one on the left is our macrocystis. That's our largest bladed, bladdered kelp. These little air bladders help it float and seek the top of the ocean. If you've been out overlooking the cliffs, you'll see all this huge kelp forest out here that is mostly macrocystis and it is harvested. It's the fastest growing plant-like thing in the world. It can grow over two feet a day and they harvest it for a lot of our foods. If you like ice cream, candy bars, breakfast cereals, uh, what an instant breakfast, um, all those things have kelp in them uh, and it's a thickening agent and we're eating kelp every day in the foods that we consume. So they do harvest this uh, macrocystis and then it can grow back two feet within a day so it doesn't harm the plant. This is one of our divers, Lisa. She uh, is in the kelp forest uh, having a ball. She's also a swimmer and she goes out diving and will help collect some of the organisms that we display in our tanks. In an aquarium like ours where everything is alive, we don't use plastic anemones and plastic kelps and things like that very much. And so um, they like to bring in the live organisms, keep them in a holding area until they're sure what's in there because you never know what you're going to bring ashore. It could be a could be a foreign species that we don't want and so they have to kind of quarantine it take a look at it find out what's there for sure and then put it in our tanks we have some really interesting things that have been found in the ocean like um, old floats that are completely covered with gooseneck barnacles and anemones and uh, scallops and just different things and you can't tell what it was but it's still floating and all these animals are on the, uh, at the top of a rope with the animals all growing over all parts of it we have that's in our discovery center Center, uh, our exploration center and that's another part of our new building the expanded uh, aquarium that you really need to come and see this is the hold fast this is like the root of the plant and what it does is it's like a big hand hold to hold on to a rock so that it can be anchored down on the bottom and then the fronds the leaves can all grow up toward the Sun out toward the surface so that uh, down in this hold fast, there's about 250 different species of animals that live in one hold fast. And it can be things like uh, shrimp and crabs and clams and worms and snails and just all kinds of animals that live in that hold fast. And one of the reasons you'll find so many fish around the kelp is that there's lots for them to eat there. It's also a, a mechanism to hide. Some of our kelp fish hide in the kelp and others are swimming around finding things to eat. Now this is an interesting story. These are sheep's head. These happen to be two females. All of the eggs when they hatch on the sheep's head are females. No males are hatched from the eggs. We d we're not really sure why, but it's a very territorial fish. The male is the dominant, and you'll see that on the next slide. Uh, let's go ahead with the male. Now take a look at the female first and notice it's all pink. It's got a little white jaw, but it's all pink. On the next slide we see the male. Dark head, dark tail, pink middle. Now what happens when these are first born is, as I say, they're all female, they're all pink, they're all together, um, but if there's no dominant male in the area, the biggest and meanest and most aggressive of all the females will sex change into a male and then can mate with all the females. Not very many animals can do that. <laughs> they do it naturally. They don't have surgery. <laughs> so here's our male sheep's head and they are very territorial. Now we come to the outer ocean and uh, we find sheephead close to shore or in the deeper water so that's kind of a transition fish now our cetaceans are dolphins porpoises and all the whales these are mammals that live in the water and they have blowholes where they breathe air like us mammals mm -hmm. they have lungs they have hair they're warm-blooded they have blubber to help keep themselves warm in the water not all of them do but most do um, and this one 
is a Pacific white-sided dolphin. And as you can see, it has a white trailing edge on the dorsal fins here, very white on the belly and near the tail, more like the markings of a um, killer whale. And no real beak, no, not like the bottlenose dolphin has a long beak. This one has just a sharp edge of the face. So here's the mouth, here's the eye, and the dolphins, porpoises, and sperm whales, killer whales, are toothed whales. They only have one blowhole. So the flipper dolphin, if you're familiar with flipper, could squeak and squawk through that little blowhole on the top of its head. This is a common dolphin. You can see it has quite a beak here. This is called a long-beaked common dolphin. It has uh, a solid black dorsal fin. Uh, it has a long beak, and it has the one blowhole right above its eye here so that as they porpoise up and down through the water, they come up and blow. Every time they come to the surface, they blow. Come up and blow, come up and blow, and that way they breathe the air. They have to voluntarily close that blowhole because it's not automatic. They can't go to sleep 100% or they would drown. They have to be able to physically and, and uh, with their brain knowingly open and close that blowhole so that they can shut out the water. Now this one is a cow-calf pair. You can see the difference in size between the, the cow here and the calf here, the mom and the baby. And this is a fairly new one, I would say a couple months old. And the next one is uh, another common dolphin. This is also a long big common dolphin. Um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between uh, the short beak common dolphin and the long beak common dolphin. They're almost identical except for this little gray area here is missing in the short beak common dolphin. So all of this is white and it'll have white all around the eye. Now this is another long beak common dolphin. You can see the teeth marks up here on the top of the, the body here. This one is blowing air out under the water, so it makes this nice cascade of bubbles and didn't wait to come up to the surface to blow, but blew out the air under the water. Uh, we're not sure why they rake each other with their teeth. They're either playing or they're fighting or they're mating or something like that, but most of them have teeth marks on the tops of their, their skins. Here we have the orcas. Every once in a while we get orcas coming in right into our shore. Um, last year I was on the Voyager off Redondo Beach and a pot of orcas came in, about 10 of them, and zipped past us so fast I could hardly get a photograph. We're after something right near Redondo Pier and gathered there and then very sedately came porpoising out again. Um, they're fabulous animals to watch and we don't get to see them very often in our area. Uh, this happened to be a uh, transient group of killer whales. We have, uh, killer whales are actually the biggest of the dolphins, but they're called a whale because they're bigger than 20 feet, so anything big is called a whale, although they're all cetaceans. Uh, this is a transient pod. We have transient ones that travel all over. We have resident ones that are up around Oregon, Washington State, and Vancouver that eat salmon right off the shore. They eat different things. The transient ones eat anything. They'll eat baby whales, they'll eat dolphins, baby dolphins if they can get them, they'll eat seals and sea lions, they'll eat fish, big grouper, they'll eat anything they can find. Uh, then we have the offshore ones that go to certain places like the islands, like the Farallon Islands, and go after seal pups and uh, sea lion pups. So we have different types of killer whales. These just happen to uh, be frolicking. Looks like they're feeding, and many times it'll be a training group where you have the adults, the moms particularly, teaching the babies how to hunt. And what's really sad is to watch them hunt a baby gray whale while you're whale watching. Uh, but it happens, and that's life. And they're not always successful. Sometimes it takes four or five hours, and the mom manages to get into really shallow water where the orcas won't go and can save the baby. Now here we have uh, some gray whales. We do our whale watching right off the shore, as I said, Redondo Beach, San Pedro, off the Spirit in uh, Portsacal. And um, the gray whales have two blowholes, as you can see, one, two, right here. These are baleen whales. All the bigger whales are baleen whales, the blue whale being the biggest animal ever to live on Earth, and is a baleen whale, has two blowholes. 
and uh, can get upwards of around 90 feet in our area here. We've had blue whales right off the coast now still. Uh, we have them off of the Channel Islands all summer, and it's just been fabulous to go out and watch them out of Santa Barbara, to go up to the upper Channel Islands and see the humpbacks and the, and the blue whales lunge feeding this 2,000-ton this animal lunging out of the water after all this krill with a great big mouth and all these ventral grooves that open up like a big tadpole mouth. So here they are right next to the boat. This is what we call fluking, where they dive down, show their tail flukes, and then the blow, where they come uh, right up next to the boats. Many of them are very friendly. And uh, as we travel down to Baja, California, in Laguna San Ignacio every spring, um, they will bring their babies over to the boats, get underneath them and push them up for you to touch and kiss and hug and scratch and brush. And it just seems like they've forgotten that we tried to kill them all. And they're so friendly, it's just amazing. I went this last spring and it just was a lifetime experience for me. When you get next to the eye of that whale that's looking right at you knowingly, it's just amazing. <laughs> And they actually seem to smile. And what they'll do then is the mom will push the baby away, turn upside down and show all her throat grooves here and say, scratch my throat. And uh, well, I have some pictures of our director actually brushing the, the throat of a gray whale. And here we are down in Baja. And uh, we go out in the little pongas here. You can see we're all suited up, so just in case anything happens and the boat flips over. But the whales don't do that. They're extremely friendly and they're so careful, they come right up along the boat and they'll actually brush the boat, but not to move the boat, just to get the baby close and lift them up so that they can lift their heads up and get touched. They like to have their gums rubbed and their their tongue underneath. They have the baleen on the top and the big tongue on the bottom and you can actually put your hand in and rub their their lips and their their baleen. The baleen is made of keratin like your fingernails and your hair so it's rather soft. Here is the, the Laguna San Ignacio where the whales come. They travel about 14,000 miles round trip from up in the Arctic where they get their main food supply, the little amphipods that they eat and travel all the way down, have their babies somewhere around here, travel all the way down to Baja, to uh, Laguna San Ignacio and three other lagoons down there, and then they sanctuary there for about three months. They nurse those babies. The babies can gain upwards of 75 pounds a day, up to 100 pounds, and so at the end of a year, they can have gained 20 tons in one year. We think probably if they didn't gain a whole lot, their for most of their weight their first year, they wouldn't survive really well. They have to go through all the shipping, they have to go through all the orcas, the great white sharks, and uh, the nets, the derelict nets that are hanging in the ocean, and there's lots of hazards for them. They're highly endangered. But here's a gray whale, Pacific gray whale. This is a baby, and uh, there's the mouth here with the baleen you can see. And then the blowhole's going to be right up here. And then the front of the head here, upper jaw and lower jaw. Now all these little pits in the top of the head here are little dimples. And in each little dimple is one stubby little hair. So whales do have hair. Here's a gray whale breaching. This is so exciting if you happen to get to see one. They leap right out of the water. And usually they start out straight up, turn on their back or side, and then just splash down in the water with an apartment-sized splash. So this is called breaching. We're not really sure why they do it. We think it's um, communication, uh, aggression. Sometimes if a, a boat, a little fishing boat will harass them, go around them too close and they have a baby or something, they'll breach. And they'll take their tail flukes out of the water and just smack the water right near the boat and say, give me some space. So we think that's uh, why they're doing the breaching. Now they can hear that, so we think it's communication. They can hear that for miles away when the whales do it. Uh, the other whales can hear them. Now here's a baby again right next to the boat. The head is so stubby, you can tell this one's a baby because uh, if, you, if you remember the breaching one, the, the female had a long head like this big long head like that. As an adult, it's actually over a quarter of the length of the whole whale, which can be 50 feet. The gray whales can be 50 feet and weigh 40 tons. So we go out there in these little 16-foot pongas, fishing boats, and you 
first pe time people are scared because they think that whale could come under the boat and just flip us all over. They don't do that. They're just very friendly and it might hurt them too. So uh, many of them have scars on their back where boats have hit them and they've recovered. And so this we call a pickle because of all the little dimples in the head and the skin is all wrinkly and the most thing they look like is a pickle when they're first born. Another pickle, another baby coming up to get touched. And it's just amazing how much they like to get touched. And they'll come up and look you right in the eye. And it is just so amazing to have them um, look, look you right in the eye and try to communicate with you. And that you can just hear them saying, touch me, touch me. More touching. This is our director of programs of our aquarium, Larry Fukuhara. And he's the one who carries a brig cleaning brush with a long handle. And he'll reach over sometimes if they come up real close to the boat and brush them and they seem to like it. Here's another breach and as you can see this is the head blow holes here blowing, eye right here and then the mouth and it's turning on its side so this is the pectoral flipper here and then the back here so you can tell it's gonna land on its back. That's called breaching. Here's a mom and baby. Mom is actually snuggling next to the baby helping push the baby up next to the boat and they're getting a nice wet blow right in the face and it's very smelly. They, uh, they don't eat a whole lot while they're down there. Actually, they don't eat for about nine months while they're migrating. Um, and they have that thick layer of blubber to help them survive. But in the 14,000 mile round trip, there really isn't much food supply for them. It's all up at the Arctic, uh, the little amphipods that they eat. And it's the only bottom feeder, so they feed in the mud. The other whales eat up in the uh, plankton area up near the surface. Here's another one. Now this one is a baby again. This is not a full grown whale yet. You can see the short round face here, head. And then here's Larry with his brush. Right up here, leaning over, brushing the top of the whale. And it's amazing. This is a huge boat. This is a 113 foot boat, Royal Polaris, that we live on while we're down there. And they come right up next to that boat. It's just amazing. Here's a spy hop. Now here's the eye. Here's the mouth, here's the lower jaw and the upper jaw. You can see all these barnacles that are on the skin of the gray whale. And um, these are parasites. When we think parasites, we think harmful. These are not harmful. They go along with the whale and as they go underwater and stir up all the mud to take a bite, the barnacles are madly feeding away and all the stuff that's getting stirred up in the water. So they get a free meal. And then the lice that are all around the barnacles are hanging on tightly. And they, we think, eat the dead skin, help keep the skin healthy. Any um, injured areas, let's say they've gotten hit by a boat propeller and there's a deep gash, those lice will just pack in that, that injured area and help it uh, get healthy again by eating all the infection, eating all the dead skin cells. Now here's a baby again. You can see how clean the skin is. Um, this one has a lower jaw here. These are throat grooves here, but here's the mouth right here. The eye is closed back here, and uh, here's Larry brushing the throat grooves, which they seem to really enjoy. We're not sure why, but they are very tactile. If you are down there and you're just watching and you're not trying to touch, you can see the babies just rolling all over their moms, just touching, touching, touching all the time. Very tactile animals. Now, at the aquarium, we have a number of programs where we serve the public. Uh, we go out to the schools and take uh, puppet shows and a lot of organisms like these that are in jars and shells and things to share with the students. Uh, we have a big summer program out on the beach where um, we as docents uh, pick a station and say tell them all about whales and dolphins, tell them all about tide pools, tell them all about pollution and conservation and, uh, and then they get to go hatch the grunion eggs and that's a station. Then they go do the world famous jellyfish dance that uh, is famous throughout the world that uh, John Olguin uh, initiated. Uh, that's in the springtime. And then uh, this is our um, exploratory center where they're teaching the kids about the research that we do. We even have high schoolers and junior high schools come in to do some of their lab projects for science fairs if they're interested in marine biology. And uh, they're, of course, supervised by the staff. Um, a lot of the volunteers will do feeding and cleaning and things like that, but we um, 
do research on um, and, and grow, uh, seahorses and um, at different types of abalone and, as I said, Garibaldi and um, all kinds of um, oh, white sea bass and just many different types of animals in the ocean that we're trying to raise and um, uh, teach people about and learn about ourselves. Here's our shark room in the aquarium, in the hall, exhibit hall, and we're showing the students. These are live sharks back in here. Great white model of a shark up here. We have big shark jaws over here and a baby white shark that's been preserved in uh, a case that they can see a baby shark. Um, so we have many other programs too for kids, and we feel that um, ocean literacy is just so important. We, we, li we know so little about our ocean that our main job is to teach people that what's out there and you don't care about things that you don't know about and you don't uh, save things that you don't love. So we teach all the kids to love the ocean, love all the animals that are there, learn about them, get interested, want to maybe want to do it as a career. And it's amazing how many children come back and say, I came here as a, as a third grader, and this is where I decided I was going to be a marine biologist. So our research, as I said, grunion. We grow baby grunion. We have baby Garibaldi. We are the only aquarium that has a permit to grow the white abalone, which is extremely rare, almost gone. And we have students come in and help feed, do projects. Here's our director, Mike Schott, with a student in the lab here. And then uh, we grow a lot of the food that the animals eat. We grow mice and shrimp, we grow algae, we grow um, uh, little uh, sea monkeys, you call them uh, brine shrimp, to feed a lot of the animals with very tiny mouths. And of course we grow seahorses. Now we have some students coming in to do tours in the summer. We have a junior and high school program where the kids come in and do a full week of training and then they can do tours for the public as the public comes in during the summer and it's wonderful if you've ever get a chance to go down in the summer to see them down there. Then we have our regular docents out on the beach doing uh, talks on grunion and different things. We have the tide pools where kids are touching the animals. And then we have students doing, this is the sandy beach demo, where they show uh, the animals that bury themselves in the sand, and those probably are junior high school students. And then we have another docent showing uh, a tour with the big um, elephant seal. Here's a uh, diagram of the inside of the aquarium with all the different shore, rocky shores, mud flats, open ocean. Uh, we have a news wall, jellyfish, sandy beaches. And then we have all of our echinoderms over here and our touch tank. And then this is a shot of the, the walk that goes out to the tide pools here when the tide goes out. And you can see the low tide here where the tide pools are beginning to be exposed. Okay, so that's it. And uh, we hope you're gonna come and see us at the aquarium. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.